I get asked lots of Power Automate questions all the time. And so today I'm going to take and answer seven of them with quick little tips, things that just help you make your Power Automate cloud flows run a little bit better and make sure you're doing things the best way. Does that sound like fun? Then let's just jump over to my desktop and take a look. So for the first tip, let's say, hey, let's think about your flows maybe from the opposite direction. So on the screen here, I have an example of one of the flows that I got asked about the other day, right? So we're like, hey, every time a new item gets created, I need to do stuff every week on that one and I need to do a th different thing at the end of four weeks. Like they had this scenario and they're having a hard time with the flow because like, they couldn't mechanically get it to do and wait. So here's the thing I try to tell people. If your flow is something like this, when an item is created, delay for X days and then do your activity, this can work. But the problem with this is then you end up with all these flows that are waiting, waiting, waiting. So if the flow changes, those flows aren't affected. Or if you're trying to wait longer than the period, right? So flow can only wait for 30 days. You try to tell it to wait for six months, it's going to blow up. So people get really frustrated when they try to write flows this way, right? So I want them to think backwards, or maybe this was backwards. I want you to think the other way. So for me, when I do this type of flow, what you're going to see is you're going to see something more in line with this. So I'm going to have a flow that runs every day. So instead of being triggered when the item gets created, I just have a flow that runs every single day at 8 a.m., right? Whatever time you want. And then it goes and it does a get items and it gets all the items that were created, in this case, 30 days ago, right? Because we want to do something every time an item gets to 30 days. So then I wrote a little formula here, right? Created greater than or equal to today minus 30 days and less than add days, right? And this one's 29 days. And so then that gets it the day range, right? Because you want things that were created at different times of the day. So you have to account for time. So that's how we do that. But by doing this, right? By doing it this way, it just wakes up. It gets all the items that meet that criteria. And if there aren't any, it's done. If there are some, then we loop through all those and do your activity. So the great thing about this is it's not, one flow running and trying to wait 30, 90, a million days, which may or may not be possible, we are able to just say, hey, every day, get up, go find the items that need to be processed because they're now in that window of seven days, 14 days, 30 days, whatever you're looking for, and then do whatever you need to do. So yeah, that was one of my students' answers this week, and I thought it was a great one, so that's our first tip. Okay, for number two, error notifications. So also another student question this last week, right? Um, but what they wanted to know was, hey, how do you do error handling? Right? There's a lot of different blogs out there. There's like people that do like try, um, try catch loops, like a more pro developer style. That's not my thing, right? I'm not a pro dev, so I don't think in those terms. So what I do on most of my um, flows that I want to be notified, right, because they're being triggered by a process other than me sitting there waiting, is we scroll down here at the bottom, at the end of all my flows, I just use the send me an email notification. And you see these little dots here? So it says, hey, I only run after the previous step either timed out, was skipped, or failed. So if you think about it, like all these other arrows, they don't have any dots. That's because by default, they all only run if the previous action was successful. So, you know, when you trigger, right, if that's successful, this runs. If this is successful, that runs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But say for whatever reason my parse JSON fails. So when parse JSON fails, then compose three says, well, I can't run because this wasn't successful. So compose three gets skipped. Response gets skipped because compose three got skipped. Switch got skipped because response got skipped. So then we get down here at the bottom and it's like, hey, wait a minute. Switch was skipped. And so I run. So this one only runs because that one was skipped failed or timed out. And then all it does is sends me an email like, hey, office hours invite failed and for and the person, right? So this is what my uh, students use to sign up for office hours, right? Over at training.powerapps91.com. If you're an enrolled student, you have access to office hours. And so usually the reason it fails is because they put in their wrong email address. And so it'll be like, hey, failed for Katie, but with two E's, right? Because Katie hit the E twice on her name. And so I'll just grab her email address, and I'll just go rerun the process with one E for Katie, and boom, it is working, right? So this is how I add error handling. If you're just trying for a quick, I just want to get a notification, I'll fix it, I'll worry about it. Like, I've seen more robust solutions. Uh, a guy today in an office hour showed me this crazy one where he's using like child flows. Like, I might make that into a video sometime. It seemed really interesting, but I just send simple emails. So that's number two. For number three, 
I like to do notes and renames, right? So what do I mean by notes and renames? For example, this particular flow, the way this one works is they press a button and whether they press the AM button or the PM button, they get an invite to AM or PM. So down here in my switch statement, what I did was I renamed this action, right, to get event v3, right, that's the normal name. I added this am to the end. And then over here to the other side, right, I added a, uh, how do you pull this thing over? There we go. I added a get event v3 pm. So I know that's the pm one, right? So that's how I keep track of is this the am or pm action by giving it a different name. I do this all the time. It, by making different names, and this flow is not a great example, but some of my other ones are, like every step has a, a common name, a name that makes sense and clicks in people's heads. And so that way it's faster to understand what the flow does, it's faster to troubleshoot, it's faster to find the step. If it's like, oh yeah, this is the one that does what I need to do, okay? So that's what I do with the names. I try to make it so the flow is more readable. Then we also have the ability, right, and to add a name, you just go up here and just type, right? And there you go. But then with these, you can also um, go in here and you can add notes, right? So if you click here, so I would have to delete now, but if we go, uh, let's go to a different one. So this compose three, I would go here and I can add a note. This gives me that lovely little section where I can add more specific information. So the most common way that I use this in my like, real day to day is back here on this one, this note, so in order for me to get the event ID that this uh, action needed, what I do here is I go ahead and use a different flow that I built. And so this is the flow for getting the event ID for me, right? It's very still a very manual process, but there you go. So when I come in here, I'm like, all right, I gotta update this because now I gotta put in, right? This was June, so for July's hours, I gotta go do this yet. So I'll create the event and then I'll run this flow and then it'll get me the event ID for the July uh, AM event, and I just copy that and push that in here where it needs to go, right? So that's a great way for me. Like I just put things here that make my life easier. Number four is concurrency. So let's go back up here. Hey, before we talk about concurrency, just a reminder, if you subscribe over at training.powerapps911.com to any of our classes, where it's the live classes, the on-demand classes, even the six-month university program, then you would have joined office hours this week too, and you would have learned all this, been able to ask your own questions and get your own answers. So go check it out. It's a great way to get some help along the way. And so in the particular action, remember we talked about get items that are X days old, all right? So this is a SharePoint get items. It will return a table of information. Maybe there's 20 that need to be processed. By default, when you get into a for each loop, right, where we loop through those 20, the default setting is it is going to loop through them one, when it's done, it'll do two, when it's done, three, et cetera, right? But all 20 of these might be independent. And you're like, hey, wouldn't it be great if it ran faster and they just ran all at the same time? That would be awesome. So what you can do is you can go here and turn on concurrency control. You say on, and then by default, a degree of parallelism is 20. So that means that it will do 20 at a time. Can you imagine how much faster it probably runs doing one at a time versus 20 at a time? Like 20 at a time is probably not 20 times faster, but it's probably a lot faster. Now, you have to be careful of this. It will go anywhere from one to 50. And it's what you have to stop and think about is like, what am I doing in this, you know, where I have do your activity, right? You know, am I hitting some other API that I'm going to cause throttling? Am I hitting SQL to cause throttling? Like, you know, 50 is not always the answer, right? 50 might be overrunning the source that you are working against in this section. So don't just come in here, turn it on 50, but do try coming in here, like turn it on, set it to five. Is five faster than one? It was, right? So you know it was cool. Then you can try, all right, let's do 10. Is 10 still okay? Yep. 15, oh, 15 takes longer than 10, right? Because the data source is probably throttling you. And so then you might, you know, say, all right, well, you know, still 10 is way faster than the one it used to be. So that is concurrency. Number five, number five is pagination, okay? So if you go back up here to get items that are X days old. So you probably didn't realize this, but this action will only get so many items back, right? So if you go here and click on settings for it, it actually has uh, a default behavior where it is just getting back the first hundred that meet your criteria, right? Kind of like delegation, but not delegation, okay? But so why that's important is if this get items that are X days old, you need to get back a thousand, it's only gonna get back a hundred. And then you make Shane, why does it only do a hundred? I get that question all the time. 
So if that's the case, then you want to turn on pagination, right? So settings, pagination, you set this to on, and then you set this and say, okay, I want you to get 5,000, right? So then now it would get up to the first 5,000 items. It does it in chunks of 100 still, you don't really care, but it's doing it in chunks of 100 up to the number that you get. Now, so once again, if you're doing get items, think through that. Now, if we do 50,000, that's okay. If I try to do 500,000, it's gonna tell me that my limit's 100,000. That's because I have a Power Automate premium license. If you have a Power Automate you know, standard license, you're gonna get a lower number than, I wanna say it's 50,000, but don't quote me on that. It's a smaller number. So the number that you have available for the maximum amount you can get is going to depend on your license, but you've gotta turn on pagination before you can even worry about that. Now, number six, we wanna talk about filtering of the data source, right? Because this is kind of a continuation of five, but it's important to understand. So we say we jump this puppy up, um, you know, so we're now like, hey, we're gonna get 50,000. So think about it. if you're like, all right, just give me back everything. So instead of filtering the data here with an OData query, like we talked about, this is the right way. OData queries are the right way, right? Sometimes what I do is I run into people that instead go in here and do a condition. They're like, all right, we'll just do created by, and they build the condition in here. They're like, you know, I don't know how to do OData, but I know how to build flow conditions. The problem is that if you have thousands of items in your SharePoint list, all thousands have to come back, right? Assuming you turn on pagination, and then this condition gets processed one at a time, right? You're like, oh, but I can turn on concurrency. You could, but either way, you're going to use, you know, for 5,000 items, you use 5,000 flow actions, right? You have a limit to the number of flow steps you can take in a day. And so you're going to run into problems, right? Like filtering this way, at the data source is bad, but I see it all the time. It's why I wanted to show it to you. Like you should not be doing this. Instead of building this condition, right? We could just do the same thing like we did here and we do an OData query. Now all the filter work is happening on the SharePoint server and then Flow is just getting back the filtered data, right? Always filter as high upstream as you can, hopefully at the data source. Don't be trying to get into your flow and writing crazy conditions to filter, right? Sometimes it happens but just know and think about that, right? Because we just talked about turning up pagination. Now you're running 5,000. Nah, it's probably not ideal. And number seven. Yes, we're at the end of the list, thankfully. Uh, number seven, we want to talk about top count. So this goes into one of my mantras when it comes to flow, and that is fail fast. Okay. So sometimes I will be helping people with the problem like this, right? We're troubleshooting stuff and they're getting back 5,000 items and they're like, man, you know, Yes, we can test it, but it takes two hours to test because we're, you know, filtering the 5,000 items every time. Like, sorry, like, do you really want to test? Yes, I want to test because I want to fail and I want to fail fast. So the easiest way to do that without changing their flow that's returning back thousands of items is I'll go here to their get items. And this is, I'm showing it for SharePoint, but it's here for Dataverse, SQL, all your tabular data sources. If we go here, there is a top count. If you set this, boom, now I can just be like, all right, just get back three. Because oftentimes, right, I don't need all five, I don't need to process all 5,000 to figure out if my fix worked or not. I can just do three or five or 10 or whatever, right? A very small number. So that way I can either prove it works fast or fail fast so that I can get back to troubleshooting. And then when I'm done, I just hit the X, but by top count, and it's like I never did it. So. Anytime that you've got those types of flows where you're getting lots of data back and you're trying to work on it, make it better, and you're like tired of waiting on the process, set that top count. So there you go. Hopefully my lovely little tips make you better at building Power Automate, right? I feel like when it comes to cloud flows, like we all know some, but there's all these little nuances. Like I've got another 20 written down over here that I just thought like seven was enough for video. Uh, but, you know, maybe I should make another video that just has seven more, right? Call it seven more pro tips. I don't know. Anyway, uh, if you have any questions, comments, leave them below. Also, remember, most of these questions I was talking about getting asked, they get asked in our office hours, right? Training.powerapps911.com. We got live classes, on-demand classes. We got a six-month university program. But all of those programs include access to monthly live office hours with this guy. And so then that's where they're asking these questions that are, you know, they're getting their answers live and in their context instead of just, you know, quick little tips like this. All right? With that, I'm gonna say thanks and have a great day.